one very long moment later, you're ready to go. Have a good session. Okay. So he hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lattice uh, session. I'm happy to share it, uh, to co chair it uh, with Alice uh, Pelé Marie. Um, so uh, we have. Um, we have several uh, papers uh, uh, presenting here, uh, and we will start uh, with a two round N out of N and multi signatures and trapdoor commitment from Lattice um, by Ivan Damgard, uh, Claudio Orlandi, Akira Takahashi, and Meti Tibuchi. And Akira will give the talk. Thank you for the introduction. So let me share the screen. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, works. Good. So yes, um, so this uh, talk is based on a joint work with Ivan Damgord, Claudio Randi from OS University and Medi Tips from NTT. So um, background. So as everybody probably knows, uh, at the moment uh, we have a, um, a NIST, a post-quantum crypto standardization going on. And then there's essentially uh, two different approaches uh, to construct lattice space signatures. And Falcon and the DDJAM are concrete instantiations of hash and sign and the Fiat Shamia Visa Boards paradigm, respectively. On the other hand, um, recently uh, there's a renewed interest in multi party uh, signing protocols, thanks to the upcoming uh, NIST standardization uh, for threshold signatures or um, a new applications to blockchain. In particular, uh, there have been many existing works on round efficient uh, and party signatures uh, based on the disk log. So if you look at the Fiat Shamia with both style signatures, uh, their structure is actually very similar uh, to Schnorr, at least uh, syntactically. So the natural question is, uh, can we construct a lattice-based round efficient multi-party signing protocols by making the most of these uh, recent observations? So in this paper, we address uh, this question. So what is N out of N signatures? For the simplest case, uh, let's say uh, there are uh, two parties, Alice and Bob, and uh, they don't know uh, the original secret key, but they only know the share of the secret key. And then uh, they agree on some message to be signed. After some interaction, uh, Alice and Bob output some signature. So of course the security requirement should uh, be as follows. So even if the one of the parties is corrupt, uh, and even if uh, the corrupt party is able to query the honest party with some message and then obtain the corresponding signature, uh, then the output forgery uh, should not be verified uh, with the uh, uh, overwhelming uh, probability. So we want to construct a signature that satisfies this property. So then our results can be summarized as follows. So we construct a two-round multi-party Fiat Shamia with a board signing uh, with a security proof in the classical random local model. Uh, based on the standard assumptions uh, like module uh, AWE or SIS. And the only required primitive is trapped or additively homomorphic commitment. And then thanks to our approach, uh, we are also able to circumvent uh, the potential uh, driver as well as like uh, attack uh, against uh, naive uh, two round instantiations. And then following the same paradigm, uh, we present two uh, schemes and out of end signatures and multi-signatures. Also, in order to um, instantiate a concrete uh, trapdoor commitment scheme, uh, we combined essentially uh, two previous uh, works, uh, Baumetal's commitment and the uh, Michancho Paikal trapdoor. Here's a comparison with the previous uh, multi-party signing protocols based on lattices. So before our work, there have been a couple of uh, T-out-of-N uh, threshold signatures. They either require uh, threshold FHE or uh, honest majority uh, multi-party computation. On the other hand, our uh, protocols uh, only require homomorphic trapdoor commitment uh, while trading the round complexity a bit. So in our uh, protocol, we require at least two rounds. And also uh, in our case, we only achieve uh, N out of N uh, functionality. In the case of multi-signature, uh, to the best of, of our knowledge, uh, the previous constructions required at least three rounds of interaction. So we were able to uh, reduce the uh, round complexity by uh, one round. So since our resulting construction is very simple, uh, let me quickly go over the uh, protocols. So here, uh, both parties hold the secret key shares. As a first step, they hash the uh, input message 
and then uh, it's hashed into the commitment key. Uh, this is a critical uh, part. And then since we rely on uh, additively homomorphic commitment, uh, so we let each party commit to the first message, and then we can take the sum of uh, these commitments in a meaningful way. Then after uh, both parties successfully uh, pass the rejection sampling, uh, they output the sum of commitments, uh, response, and uh, commitment randomness. And basically that's about it. Okay, so to conclude in this work, uh, we present a multi-party fiat shami with a board signing uh, protocols with a low round complexity. And then I want to remark that uh, essentially uh, any progress in the multi-party uh, discrete log-based signing uh, also uh, affects the lattice-based counterparts. So whenever there's some updates, we should always uh, look at the applicability to lattice setting. But of course, there are uh, subtle, several subtle differences. For example, in our construction, uh, we had to actually change the parameters and the signature size depending on the number of parties, which is not the case for the uh, discrete log-based uh, instantiations. Also, um, due to the additional step uh, of rejection sampling, uh, security proof is a bit more involved. Also, we have to wait for all the parties to pass the rejection sampling. So there should be uh, sufficiently many uh, parallel repetitions uh, for a large end. So scalability, uh, so improving the scalability is an interesting future work. There are a couple of uh, open questions. So of, of course, it, it would be very interesting if you can make the signature size uh, less dependent on the number of parties. Also, since uh, in our work, uh, we only gave a security proof in the classical random walk model. Also, we relied on the Hawking lemma, uh, giving tighter security reduction, and the proof in the QROM uh, would be a very interesting follow-up work. So thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Akira, for uh, this presentation and also for the video uh, online. So are there any questions? Don't hesitate to ask on, so there is the chat here. Uh, there is also the chat on Zulip. And uh, if you want, you can raise hands. Oh yes, there is a question on the, on the, on the chat. Uh, so uh, can you elaborate a bit more on the difficulty of proving uh, the security in the QROM, please? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So basically, uh, the use of trapdoor commitment uh, inevitably requires uh, the computationally uh, binding uh, property of the commitment. And in order to uh, give a security reduction to binding, um, it seems like we need some kind of rewinding technique because we have to ask the adversary to submit two openings to the commitments. So this is this seems to be a, a major uh, a block uh, for the QROM because uh, uh, my understanding about the Kurom, uh, Fiat Shamia in the Kurom is that uh, we aren't, we are not able to uh, rewind the adversary. So I just don't see how uh, uh, Kurom proof can be made uh, with trapdoor commitment. I see. Thank you. There is another question. Um, have you explored if this approach would work in the two party dishonest majority setting? Um, so, so I'm not sure what the two party dishonest majority. So basically what we achieved is a two party signing. And even if one of the parties corrupt, uh, the security is, uh, can be still proven. So, so I'm not sure what exactly two party dishonest majority. Is. Yeah. Um, uh, Frank, can you uh, explain what were your, what you had in mind? In this question, yeah, you know, the, the part oh. of it would be uh, um, semi honest, or or can this work in a, in a dishonest majority setting? But it looks like it, it, you, you, you answered it, so it looks like it, it will work in that in that um, when, when one party is, is dishonest, exactly. Yeah, so yes, of course. So in our setting, uh, we assume that the adversary is malicious, so. Yeah, so it's, a, it's essentially dishonest, malicious security. All right, thanks. I had one question also. Uh, 
so I'm not sure I grasped the difference, but what is exactly the difference between a multi-signature and a n out of n signature in terms of use case? Can we build uh, one from another, maybe? Um, so that's an interesting question. So, so at least in uh, our paper, we define uh, as follows. So n out of n signature, uh, you have some dedicated uh, interactive key generation protocol, and then uh, all parties agree on some single public key. But uh, for multi-signature, you don't need any uh, uh, key generation protocol. Each party just uh, outputs their own uh, key pair. And then uh, whenever they want to uh, sign something, uh, they uh, agree on some sort of aggregated public key. And then the signature is also verified with respect to uh, these aggregated public keys. Um, so at least, uh, I guess, multi-signature is more often used in uh, blockchain applications. Um, I'm not sure about the uh, n out of n signature. That's, uh, yeah, so for concrete application, I'm actually not completely sure. Okay, and we cannot build, uh, uh, so we cannot build um, um, multi-signature from n out of n signatures? Or the so other way they, around? So, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So because they, uh, they behave very similarly, but uh, I'm not sure if there's any generic way to transform uh, one to the other. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No worries. So I, I think we can go to the next talk and maybe come back if there is still question in the end or answer in the Zulip chat. So our next talk is going to be on shorter lattice based zero knowledge proofs via one time commitment. Uh, this is a work by Vadim Lubashevsky, Nok Kan Nguyen, sorry if I missay your name and Gregor Seiler, and Khan is going to, to give the talk. Are you here? Uh, sorry, I just lost internet. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, um, yeah, let me share my screen. So okay, we see, see it. Yeah. OK, great. Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Actually, I didn't actually, yeah, I didn't hear it because of the internet loss, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, hi, my name is Khan. I'm a PhD student at IBM Research Zurich and ETH Zurich, and today I'm going to talk about shorter lattice based zero knowledge proofs by one time commitments. So, this is joint work with Vadim Lubashevsky and Gregor Sila. Okay, let's start with rejection sampling, which was kind of mentioned in the previous talk. So it is used in many lattice-based zero-knowledge proofs protocols, and it is used to ensure the zero-knowledge property. So let's just illustrate uh, this idea with the following example, which is a simple fiat shami with a boards protocol. Um, so suppose we want to prove knowledge of a vector S, which has small coefficients, such that IS is equal to U over some ring, let's say integers modulus and prime Q. So what we do is uh, the prover starts by generating a masking Y from a discrete Gaussian uh, with standard deviation sigma, and then it sends W, which is A times Y. Then the verifier samples a challenge C and then sends it to the prover. And then finally, the prover computes Z equal to Y plus CS. So the main idea of rejection sampling here is that, as you can see, the distribution of Z is kind of dependent on the secret, right? It is the distribution is the discrete Gaussian shifted by C times S. So the idea here is to force the distribution of Z to be independent of the secret so that we can actually simulate the Z and then simulate the transcript. So let's say we want uh, Z to behave like it's taken from a discrete Gaussian centered at zero, then it's independent of the secret. So in practice, what we do is that we have one more step where we say, okay, we output Z with certain probability and then this probability is, as you can see here, is the minimum of one and, uh, and probability of getting set from the discrete Gaussian divided by the probability of getting the discrete, uh, pro probability of getting set from the shifted discrete Gaussian times some parameter M. And then this parameter M dictates how many repetitions we need to make until, well, the prover doesn't abort or outputs something. So let's recall how we choose usually choose M and the standard deviation. So to choose M, we have, we want to, we want this fraction here, this term here to be 
less than one for almost all the sets. So what we do is we look at the maximum over sets of this term. So if we just do the math, this is just the maximum over set of e to the minus two um, inner product of z and v plus the norm of v squared divided by two sigma squared. In our case, v is the c times s part. So the next step where we choose the parameters is we use the tailbound inequality, which says that if z is chosen from a discrete Gaussian, then the absolute value of the inner product is at most 12 times sigma times the norm of v with, with, with an overwhelming probability. And by applying the inequality up there, we can just set m to be equal to yeah, e to the 24 sigma times the norm of v plus norm of v squared divided by two sigma squared. So practically, if we say, okay, let's uh, have the number of repetitions equal to three, then we then by using this equation, we can set the standard, devi standard deviation to be around 11 times the norm of v. So the question is if we can do better. So the main idea of this paper is the following observation. So what if we force the inner product of z and v to be non-negative? So the first one question is, what do we mean by forcing? And the second question is, what's the motivation for that? So to answer the first question, we have to go back to the protocol. So what's new is that the prover in the end also checks if the inner product of Z and CS is, is non-negative. So if it's negative, then it aborts. And if it's non-negative, it continues just like before. So what's the motivation behind it? Well. If we force this condition, then we don't really have to rely on the tailbound inequality anymore because it's kind of loose. Instead, we can just bound this expression by e to the norm of v squared divided by two sigma squared, because here we know that the inner product is non-negative. And we can, we can just set m to be this. So if we want to keep the number of repetitions to be around three, then we set the standard devi deviation to be around 1.11 times the norm of V, which is now around 10 times, uh, 10 times less than the, previous, uh, than the previous bound. Okay, so now the question is, if, if it comes for free, if there are any issues, well, if we go back to the previous protocol, it gets a bit fishy, right? Because if the verify gets the Z, then they know that the inner product is non-negative. So uh, if we, for example, want to construct a signature scheme out of it, then if the verify gathers a lot of signatures, then it gets more and more information about the S, which is, let's say, the secret key. So what we do is that we find a nice application in the so-called one-time commitments. So there have, there have been, well, a few recent works which, uh, where they propose efficient protocols for proving uh, certain linear and multiplicative relations between the committed messages uh, using lattice-based uh, commitment scheme. So, so yeah, so the general structure of the protocol is that the prover starts by committing to some messages under some fresh randomness, and then they send the commitment. And then there's some fancy stuff going on. And then in the end, the prover wants to do the opening proof. So what does it mean? Then the verifier sends the challenge C, and then the prover does similar thing as before. And then, yeah, it computes Z equal to Y plus CR, where R is the randomness. And here we add this additional step where we check if the inner product is non-negative. And then, yeah, if, if, if all the conditions are satisfied, then we send the Z. Um, so yeah, so the problem might still appear, right? If the verifier gets the Z, they know that the inner product of Z and CR is not negative. Well, uh, can, can you uh, uh, can you finish in uh, like? Uh, oh, uh, yes, yeah. just now. Just sorry, now. sorry, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so so it's still fine because we uh, the prover when we run the protocol, the prover will get fresh randomness. So this means that we just um, lose one bit. Well, we just leak one bit of the randomness. Uh, so yeah, so so basically, we apply the strategy to some previous works to to obtain proof sizes by around twenty to thirty percent smaller than previous works. So yeah, uh, so yeah, we are running out of time. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you for the for the short talk and for the long video online.
Uh, is there any question? So is there, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand and then unmute yourself or? Okay, it was a, a quick question. Yeah. Uh, your, so you keep, I forgot the notation, you keep only the Z such that the inner product with what are Z and CS, I guess. I mean, the inner product is non negative. Z and V is non negative. This is a geometric condition. Do you have any intuition on the, what's happening? And so, I mean, why do you want to keep the Z that are close to V and not the Z that are away from V? Is there any geometric stuff we can understand? Um, well, in terms of geometry, well, the, the main motivation is li literally just to have a bound, a tight bound on this expression up there so that we can get the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, standard deviation as possible. Um, as you can see, there is one more thing which I kind of uh, ignored for, for the presentation is that we have this additional condition, additional if here, right? So we say if the uh, in the product is negative, then we abort, right? But we see, um, so this zero is this, I don't know, this threshold zero is important because if Z is chosen from a discrete Gaussian, then the probability that it's non-negative is at least one half. So this is this also affects how many times we need to repeat the protocol. So so um, so yeah. So we also try to play around with uh, having different threshold than zero, yeah. I don't know, ten or something. But uh, uh, we didn't get much. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah, get it does anything. not change too much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think thanks. we need to go to the next talk. Yeah, I think. Okay. Go ahead. So it's still, okay. Uh, okay, so the next talk is going to be on uh, sampling, sampling in lattices, sampling non-Gaussian distribution in lattices, exactly. Uh, so this is a work by Maxime Planson and Thomas Prest. And Maxime is going, I guess, Maxime is going to give the talk. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see the slides and okay. yes, everything is good. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And indeed, I'm going to talk about sampling distributions on lattices. Um, wait, okay. Um, okay, so we are given a basis of a lattice and a target vector in the space, and we want to sample from some distribution that's defined on the lattice. Now, for cryptography, we want uh, D to be independent of the basis because usually the basis is a secret. And we want the center of D to be the target. And finally, we want the standard deviation to be as small as possible. So why do we want to do this? Uh, we want to do this because um, for many constructions in lattice cryptography, uh, lattice numbers are very useful. It's a useful tool for these. So here's a list of examples of what you can do with a lattice sampler. Um, yeah. So. Uh, the list of existing practical lattice samplers is not very long. For unstructured lattices, we have client sampler and PyCard sampler. Uh, just a quick mention for specific types of cryptographic lattices, there exist some other samplers, but I only have five minutes. So we'll just uh, go back to general lattices. So these two unstructured lattice samplers have uh, some common similarities, which are they're constructed as uh, randomized variants of decoding algorithms. They're, they sample from discrete Gaussians and they have a uh, precision to width uh, trade off. So, this brings me to our contribution, which is uh, the design of a framework for which an instantiation is a lattice sampler. Um, so, from a high level, uh, the framework is based on uh, geometric uh, natural IDs that have been around a while. So, I described this ID really quick. Uh, say you want to sample from a discrete Gaussian on the lattice. Uh, first, you sample from the continuous usual uh, Gaussian in the space. This gives you some points uh, here. And uh, you map this point to a closed lattice point using a decoding algorithm. So intuitively, this strategy, uh, as the standard deviation goes to infinity, it should output the discrete Gaussian distribution. Um, and this is actually what Rigev used in his uh, bootstrapping step of the LWE paper. Um, but 
uh, as we show in the paper, the Gaussian distributions are not the best for this method. Um, so we uh, define two notions, which are regularity for the decoding algorithm and scormonicity for the distribution um, that make uh, the framework uh, correct. So I move on to instantiations. So just a quick summary of what's the main takeaway for this. Uh, so with uh, this framework, we can sample from various distributions that are suitable to various norms and not only Euclidean as for the, the Gaussian distributions. Uh, second, the expected L2 norm of uh, our samplers is uh, usually uh, n to the 1.5 worse than the Gaussian samplers. Um, so this is the main uh, caveat of the framework. But if you take the relevant norm to measure the size of the output, then this uh, you win a factor root n on this, and it's only worse by a factor n, but still worse. Um, and also, we have a runtime to weight trade off because the sampler is always going to be exact. The output distribution is the ideal distribution you want to sample. And so, if you decrease the standard deviation too much, then the algorithm will struggle uh, outputting uh, uh, lattice points. And finally, our uh, size of the basis factor, which is on quotes for a reason, uh, in the minimum width, uh, has a very different nature than the one from uh, client by cut samplers, uh, meaning that uh, for very specific bases of very specific lattices, it could even be uh, close to zero. Um, so yeah, this is a, a kind of a major uh, difference with the state of the art algorithms. So just some final words, uh, when can this framework be useful? So if you need to sample from some distribution that's suitable to some other norm than Euclidean, this uh, might be useful for you. And if you want to, if you're able to construct a basis that minimizes this uh, new size of the basis factor, then uh, this algorithm could be, uh, this framework could be, could be sampling efficiently. Uh, okay. And also, just a quick mention, there's, there may be some room for improvement, and there are interesting uh, open questions uh, arising from it. And uh, that's, uh, that's about it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Maxime. Are there any questions for Maxime? I see something in the chat. OK, so it's a question from Iman. Uh, so are there any natural examples of bases that performs well under your new size of bases? And can you mention briefly what is the new function, what this new function looks like? Uh, yeah, so for example, if you take, um, so I'll have to go back a bit. Um, here, the, the scharmonic distribution that we uh, introduce for example, constant functions are uniform and they yield uh, a uniform distribution. And for example, if you sample from a uniform distribution in a hypercube, then for example, the lattice Zn is going to be uh, with the basis identity is going to give you uh, a zero, uh, like a perfect sampling regardless of the standard deviation. And so if you slightly modify this identity, if your basis is close to identity, then this factor is going to be close to, but like, anyway, it, it, it does depend a lot on the distribution you use, but for example, uh, uniform and uh, ZN is a good example uh, here, if that answers your question. Okay, thanks. I think that answers it. Is there another question? I think we still have maybe time for one question. So I can have a very short one maybe uh, about runtime. Do you like, if you don't care about having elements that are n or n square root 10 times larger than Gaussian samplers, uh, can you have them faster than Gaussian samplers? Um, yeah, I mean, you can, it's not, it's not really fast. It's probably not faster, uh, but uh, yeah, if you increase the standard deviation a lot, then, uh, you will have uh, you 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 will have a fast runtime. The runtime is more like the number of repetitions because there is a rejection sampling step, which I ignored in the presentation. Uh, and it, as you increase the standard deviation, then uh, you reduce uh, the the rejection rates. So, yeah, 
Spencer's uh, question. Okay, thank you. So mm -hmm. we move on to the next talk. Okay, so the next talk is on the success probability of solving unique SVP via BKZ. Uh, it's uh, from Imon W. Post Less Weight and Fernando Virdia. I hope I pronounced correctly. And Fernando will give the talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, um, yes. Can awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about the uh, joint work with Eamon Postwave. And um, um, essentially, what we're looking at in this paper is we're looking at the complexity of solving the learning with errors problems um, using the primal attack strategy that uh, essentially reduces it to a unique uh, shortest vector problem instance by constructing a lattice that contains as its unique shortest vector what is essentially a concatenation of the secret and the error vectors from the LW instance. Um, so of course, uh, what we're interested in is the cause of this attack. And uh, the key observation is that in practice, uh, recovery, uh, and that was known already in previous literature, is that recovery of the target vector follows from recovery of an orthogonal projection of, um, of this target vector. And uh, currently, the analysis um, usually used for uh, estimating this cost is by Alkimetol and says that if one were to pick BKZ for a, a, lattice, for a lattice reduction algorithm to, to try to find this target vector, um, they should aim to, to choose the smallest uh, block size beta um, such that the, the condition on screen um, holds. And then uh, essentially it says at the end of lattice reduction, um, we expect to find this projection and then recover the full vector. Um, uh, Alkim's et al. Um, heuristic was verifiably, uh, verified experimentally in uh, 2017 by Albrecht et al. And um, in their uh, paper, they ran multiple experiments and they observed that indeed, if one chooses uh, the block size following uh, the Alkim et al. heuristic, uh, one can see that the success probability for solving LW is very high. Uh, however, they also observed that if one were to choose slightly smaller uh, block sizes, hence resulting in a cheaper attack, Still, to some extent, it is possible to get uh, relatively high success probabilities um, for solving LWE. So the main contribution in, uh, in our paper is that we extend the Alchemical model and uh, also related work by Dachman Soler et al. Uh, to, uh, approach, to predict the success probability of uh, any given block size, and in particularly, particularly of these smaller, slightly smaller block sizes. Um, for those in the know, um, um, the way this work is that um, we try to simulate the state of the uh, basis of the lattice being reduced as it is being reduced. Um, and we try to compute what is the probability at the end of every uh, tour of uh, BKZ or of progressive BKZ, what is the probability of recovering this orthogonal projection. Uh, so we start and uh, what we do is we model the norm of the orthogonal projection as a random variable. And then we use BKZ simulators to tell us um, what is the norm uh, for the uh, Grand-Schmidt vectors of the basis that are those that are uh, involved directly in the recovery of this orthogonal projection. So we start from uh, the profile that we expect for an input basis and we simulate a tour of BKZ and then we ask, okay, what is the probability that the, uh, the inequality holds and lead us to recovery of, this, of the projection? And then we accumulate this probability and we simulate another tour of BKZ and then we compute the probability again and so on for as many tours as uh, requested for BKZ. And at the end, this will tell us what is overall the expected probability of, uh, of finding the projection using that particular block size. We run uh, many experiments and um, we run them over different uh, distributions for the secret and the error vector. Um, and so here are, for example, two, two characteristic um, plots that come out of these experiments. Many more are present in the paper and. Uh, we go in, uh, in uh, a lot more detail, of course, about various phenomena that we observe happening. But overall, what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, dashed lines that tell us the predicted probability uh, for a given block size of solving LW, and then across is that say what is the major probability for that algorithm or for that secret or error distribution. Um, we chose instances that we expected to be able to solve with a block size of around 60, and then we investigated running the algorithms with slightly smaller or larger block sizes. And overall, it seems that the simulators are, are indeed able to tell us what, uh, what the probability of solving LW should be um, for the algorithms, even if the block size is not optimal. Of course, the natural question is um, whether this has an impact on uh, current cryptographic parameters. And to see this, we chose um, parameters that were available at the time of writing for the um, three chem finalists for the NISPQC process. 
And uh, we chose first the um, expected block size from the given by the previous methodology. Um, and then we use our simulator to simulate what would be uh, the probability distribution of a successful block size uh, on these parameters. And what we can see is that the expected successful block size that we see in the middle column is slightly larger than what the previous theory suggested. We explain why this happens. It's a bit counterintuitively, but uh, counterintuitive, but we explain why it happens in the paper. Um, and we also can measure uh, the standard deviation of the successful block size. And this somehow tells us how much smaller we can pick uh, a block size while still expecting to have a, a successful attack on LWG. And the observations here are good news uh, because the standard deviation still stays small, saying that uh, low probability attacks by just running the primal attack with a smaller block size should not be uh, particularly cheaper because it should not be possible to pick a significantly smaller block size to run the attack. And also the expected block size is higher than before. So really looks like uh, the Alchemetol methodology um, using at the time some in the way it was used uh, when, uh, when first, uh, when first uh, detailed, was underestimating the hardness of LWG. So in conclusion, uh, we believe that our simulators are able to capture the success probability of smaller than expected block sizes. Uh, the effect seems to be consistent across secret and error distributions for LWG, and the hardness of uh, cryptographically specified parameters so far does not seem to be uh, significantly impacted. Thank you. Presentation. Oh, sorry, sorry, thank you, Fernando, for this presentation and the, the video online. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. So I'm monitoring the chat and the, the Zulip. Uh, if not, I can start uh, start with one. Um, so in the experiment uh, that you showed in the first table, uh, it seems uh, it seems that uh, the success probability decrease, decreases when the dimension increases, like it goes from eighty three to eight to eight. Oh, uh, sorry. Do you mean no, this one? No yes, here. It seems to decrease when n increases. Is there? Is it a, like a general uh, thing that you notice, or is it artifacts from the from uh, from the experiments? Yeah, we. So we. It might be artifacts. We didn't see specifically something like this. Uh, what worried us the most, of course, was that um, there seems always that the gap of ten would still result in a high probability attack, and we were worried that maybe this would depend on the secret dimension. Yeah. Um, but from running the simulator on the cryptographically sized parameters, uh, it doesn't look like that's the case. The, the standard deviation stays relatively tight. Um, so yeah, I think it, it might just be an artifact of the particular instances that were chosen. Okay, okay. Because the simulator uh, doesn't use... Uh, here, you, uh, you run uh, specific instances uh, without simulation. These were, yeah, these are the numbers from the 2017 paper. And uh, at the time, uh, these were just uh, by choosing fixed block sizes and, and seeing what happened. Uh, there was no simulation before it, behind it. Okay. Um, but yeah, with the, now, with the uh, newer numbers, um, it does seem that indeed one, one, one can stay close to it and, and the slope of the curve doesn't seem to change even if one increases significantly the dimension, at least as far as the output of the simulator is concerned. Okay, I see. Are there other questions? No. And on this slide, it seems that uh, the like there is some noise around the the, the um, expected um, simulation. Um, well, can, can you explain that? Uh, other than uh, above, when we see that there is a like a phenomenon that you explained in the paper, but below, uh, for example, on the right side, it seems that it's always below. Is there an yes. explanation for that? Yes, um, mostly has to do with the, how we define the probability, I think, in the sense that in progressive BKZ, one is trying every block size and increasing. And so the, the one can really get a, a strictly increasing function for the cumulative, uh, cumulative mass function for the probability distribution. While on the left with BKZ, um, it, is not, it is not necessarily always the case that since there is some randomness in the algorithm itself, it is possible to observe an instance that can that happens to be solved by running BKZ uh, 60, let's say, uh, but it's not solved by running 61. And uh, this could have to do with the uh, pre-processing strategies. We investigated a little bit about that, but um, but yes, uh, formally it, it seems to just be the case. And um, and yeah, so there is a little bit of noise. It might be possible to maybe defend a variant of BKZ that uh, that gives some guarantee in that sense, but. 
But yeah, that's for example where we see that the line goes up and down, the major probability. So there is a, a bit of a technicality there. Okay. And on the right, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, on the left, the, the BK, progressive BKZ um, is in black, so is tau equal to one. And did you try with tau higher in this? Uh, how does it compare with the BKZ? Uh, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, superimposition, yes. Um, I think we have a table on the paper. Um, okay. It does, in, um, it does increase a little bit, uh, but uh, so as in uh, it, the curve moves a little bit to the left but mm -hmm. uh, uh, not as much because we notice that if one increases tau too much, um, it happens a lot of the time that progressive BK, that uh, the BKZ step inside progressive BKZ will just auto abort because they cannot uh, make any significant progress on the state of the basis. Because in some sense, progressive BKZ does so much lattice reduction and it increases so slowly the block size that very often BKZ just have nothing that it can do and one ends up not doing as much as what the simulator would assume by just saying, oh, every tour, gives you some progress. Um, so in that sense, one would need as, as some sort maybe of stricter modeling to be able to predict when progressive BKZ will, uh, will run a tour but get no progress. And, uh, and in that case, one might be able to tell, but yes, um, it improves, but not significantly because of this phenomenon. Maybe some basis re-randomization inside of progressive BKZ could help there. Okay, okay, thanks. Are there other questions? Okay. Do you plan on publishing the, the code uh, for the estimation somewhere? Uh, yes, so we the code for both the oh, yeah, experiments sure. and for the simulator is there. We have not planned of, uh, I have not uh, looked into, we tried looking into attaching into the estimator a little, the LW estimator, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit tricky. Um, so at the moment, not really. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, so I guess we can, Move to the next paper. Okay, so let's go for the next last talk of this session about slide type, slide type reduction, sorry, and how fast it converges. And so this is a work by Michael Walter, and Michael, I guess, is going to give the talk. We cannot hear you, Michael. Or at least I cannot. Uh, I. Yeah. Are you talking? Yeah, now I think I hear you. Hear me? Okay. Yeah, it's a bit low. Can you try? I can try to increase it. Okay, that's not that good. <clears throat> it's good? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, thanks, Alice. So, uh, like Fernando, I also want to talk about lattice reduction. And if you're not familiar with the literature, uh, this might surprise you, but there are actually other lattice reductions algorithms out there except for BKZ. But BKZ tends to grab all the headlines uh, because it seems to perform best in practice. But in this talk, I want to uh, focus on a class of algorithms called, uh, well, which I call slide type reductions. And so far, these type of algorithms have been considered more of theoretical interest because we can actually prove better bounds for them on the uh, trade-off between running time and output quality. Uh, but in practice, it seems somehow inferior to BKZ. So what, we, well, what I do with this work is I apply a more um, fine-grained analysis to this class of algorithms. And this actually reveals a new parameter to control this trade-off between running time and uh, quality. And, this, um, and then we show that uh, you, know, you can tweak this parameter to improve slide reduction in practice actually, actually significantly up to the point where it's actually competitive in practice with the state of the R, uh, aka BKZ. And this is interesting because this type of algorithm is actually very easily parallelizable, which is in contrast to BKZ, which is inherently sequential. So uh, also our analysis gives us uh, a couple of side results um, uh, for uh, running times on an algorithm called block ranking reduction. But I'm going to focus on the other part in, uh, for this. So, um, so, you know, Fernando hinted at that in the previous talk, but uh, basis can be represented effectively by, by its shape uh, or Gram-Schmidt profile, same thing. Um, and the goal of lattice reduction is effectively, at least in my view, or you can define it this way, to minimize the first entry. And what uh, Fernando also hinted at is that um, um, the shapes of bases can often be just uh, you know, approximated by a line. So for this talk, I'm just gonna uh, use these idealized versions of a basis shape. 
And the way that lattice reduction works is by uh, picking out projected subblocks of uh, the basis and applying an SVP oracle to it. And then the shape of the basis might look something like this. And this, this operation is actually fairly expensive, but it can help to improve the basis globally if you do it in a smart way. Um, if you apply it in, in a smart strategy over and over again. And the trade-off of lattice reduction is usually controlled by the size of the block that you're considering, because the larger the block size, um, the more expensive the SAP oracle, but the output quality actually uh, of the entire basis will be better in the end. And there's another op operation that you can do, which is called dual SAP reduction, um, which effectively, instead of minimizing the first uh, entry in a project subblock, it actually maximizes the last entry. And complexity-wise, these two are exactly the same though. And so slide reduction actually works in the following way. It will break up your basis in, um, in disjoint subblocks and uh, apply the SCP oracle to it. And note that this happens uh, completely independently, so this can be parallelized very easily. Um, and then in the second step, uh, slide reduction shifts the block by one and applies a dual SCP algorithm to it, the dual SCP reduction. And these two steps are uh, looped over and over again. And you should notice that there are these pivot elements in the middle, which are in the first step minimized with regards to the block to the right, and uh, in the second step maximized with regards to the block to the left. And this way, information flows through the basis and uh, minimizes the first entry, or helps to minimize the first entry. And I want to briefly show uh, what this looks like in action. So here's a simulation of, uh, of how this works. Uh, I hope you can see the video. Uh, and as you see, um, the, um, the entry on the far left actually starts creeping towards this red line. Um, and the red line is what we would expect as a result here. Uh, so this is what we expect for the, for the length of the first entry. Right? Um, and so this continues for a while, um, which I don't want to bore you with any further. So to understand what, um, what we do in this work, we have to go back briefly um, to uh, the SVP reduction, what we modeled, we said that if you apply the SVP reduction to a projected subblock, we said the sh shape that comes out looks something like this. But uh, recently it was observed in, in the work on the general seed kernel from Eurocrypt 2019 that uh, if you use a modern SVP solver, this is actually a pretty bad uh, model of what actually happens. So what happens is actually something closer to this. Not only is the first entry minimized, but actually the entire head of the basis is reduced to some degree. And analogously, obviously, for the for the uh, for the dual operation. And so, what does this mean? Well, let's have a look at slide reduction again. After the first step, um, what the shape of the basis looks like is more like this than what we had before. And now it seems natural to actually shift the, the dual blocks not by one uh, vector, by one entry, but actually do it by more than one, by the entire head of the basis. Um, and the question is, what happens? What does it do to the algorithm? Um, and there is another animation here. I want to show, I hope this is the right one. Yes, so this is uh, what now happens. And as you can see, this algorithm seems to converge much faster than the one before. Um, although if you look very closely or have paid attention very closely, uh, it also converges to a red line, but this red line now is slightly higher than the one that we saw before. Um, and what this means is that this, this shift by the dual blocks actually offers a trade-off between uh, the running time and the output quality. Um, and, and this is sort of the contribution of this work is that we analyze this trade-off and you know, we show that like, we actually show that there is actually a trade-off and we show that you can tweak it so that it becomes, that side reduction becomes competitive in practice, which uh, we backed up by experiments, um, you know, where, um, yeah, where we show that if you, if you choose this overlap well, this overlap parameter, this shift by the, of the dual blocks, then you get something that is competitive. Uh, and that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any question for Michael? On the chat anywhere? Okay, maybe I can uh, I can start. But I had a question on the long talk, but I mean, <laughs> not really. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so when you increase the overlap, you reduce the number of SVP calls, but you also increase like the root hermit factor. Mm -hmm. And if you decrease the block size, you also increase the root hermit factor and each SVP call is going to be faster. So in, it's kind of seemed like you reduce the time, but you decrease the quality. How does that compare? 
Like, yeah. So, so these are two um, two similar trade-offs, right? Like the block size, you know, you can call, control the blocks, uh, the, the trade-off, and uh, this, um, yeah, uh, this is overlap. You can control the the trade-off. And uh, what we show in this work effectively is um, that choosing it to be one is very suboptimal. Like you can gain very much practical, um, like independently of the block size, effectively. Uh, that you chose in the beginning, you can always get a little bit better by choosing the overlap a little bit better. Like, or, you know, like you can, we actually have some, some, some arguments um, while we do some numerical um, estimations that show, you know, like that actually compare exactly the two trade-offs, right? What's better at this? Like if you have a baseline block size, what's better if you want to reduce the running time, reducing the block size or switching the overlap. Yeah. Um, and so this, yeah, so, but again, we didn't do much uh, much optimization here, so I I'm, I believe there's much more uh, work to, to to be done here to actually optimize this a little bit more. But uh, yeah. Okay. Any, Are any other questions? I'm questions currently not. On the chat. I'm also open for emails or anything else. If anyone. <laughs> yeah, I also have uh, another naive question. So you say slight slight reduction is easily parallelizable. So mm -hmm. on what you described, it seems indeed. So there is no like hidden stuff that if you have n processors, you can expect a gain of n, basically. Or if you have that many blocks, so if your bases, right? Like you need you need to have this many blocks in your bases, and this mm -hmm. might be the limiting factor in many cases. If you have, you know, if, like if you think of a typical example where the lattice bases might be, I don't know, like like 300 and you want a block size of 180 while well, there's two blocks, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> um, that's all you can gain from this. So, but in other cases, when you have like a QRE lattice, for example, of uh, dimension 800 or something, and you want to reduce with a block size 200, then you can get a, a factor for just for the parallelization trivially in this case. Okay, yeah, thanks. So there is one question now in the chat. Um, okay. So a question of Iman, are there any new heuristic on the tails of the slide block using this new technique? Uh, what if, uh, can, you, can you read that again? Can so I say it again, yeah. Maybe yeah. also Iman, if you want to unmute, you can unmute, otherwise I just read it again. So he's asking for if there is any new heuristics on the tails of the block of the slide block, when you use, uh, I guess, a new technique of overlapping. Uh, not not really, right? Like um, the like inside the block. I mean, we we just assume that the first part is HKZ reduced, which is pretty typical um, uh, assumption. On the tail, I, I don't really know what's happening there. I think that's. I'm, I'm guessing it'll. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what the SAP. It, it'll depend on what the SAP solver is doing there. I think that was a question, like the tail inside the block, right? Um, yeah, thanks, Michael. Just wondering if it was steeper, um, it could actually make solving the primal attack in the final block easier. Uh, but it was just uh, just in case you'd noticed any new uh, any new phenomena in the tails, because uh, the sort of uh, inspiration of this work seemed to be experimental, new uh, <clears throat> you know new experimental evidence. I just wondered if you'd seen anything in the tail as well. I mean, in some sense, you can you can you can choose a little bit, right? Like you you can either terminate this algorithm after like a, a step where all the um, uh, blocks were or where the blocks were were uh, reduced using the SVP oracle, or you can terminate after a dual SVP reduction, right? And after the dual SVP reduction, then the tail actually looks pretty good. It looks like a like a dual HKZ uh, basis at least in the tail, right? The last few like for the overlap. Um, does that help? But it's, it's effectively the same as applying the whole algorithm to the dual lattice. So. OK, thank you. So if there is no more question, I think we are almost on time to finish this session. Um, I don't know. So now is social hour. So maybe if some people want to continue asking questions. Uh, there, there was just one question on the chat uh, from Yangyu to Maxim, but maybe they can uh, answer directly there. Uh, in the chat on Zulip or, or here on, on, on Zoom? Uh, on no, Zulip. Zulip, but it's not for okay. you, Michael. It's for Maxim. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <All right. laughs> yeah, okay. If anyone wants to put one on, on Zulip for me, I'm, I'm also happy to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. More questions. 
you can continue asking questions on Zulip for whatever time you want. <laughs> and if there is no more question here, maybe we we conclude. Sure. Okay, so thank you everyone for 